ete ti ete ta ko te reo whaka miha e whaka manoa atu nei ki tēnei moko puna ae. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa kwa piri mai ki tēnei hōtaka o Pautama i tēnei rā. Ko te tikanga ia ka ka huitahi tātou i ngā kōrero o te tohi, o te pūre, o tira i ngā whiako whaiaro kwa pā mai ki tēnei huna i tēnei rā. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe te kōka, kwa piri mai ko whakawātea nei i tō rātaka i tēnei rā ki a huitahi ki a māua ko te aki o tira te whānau whānui o Pautama Rites of Passage. E mihi ana, ko tēnā koe. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou te whānau kua whakarite i tēnei mō mō wānanga, mō ngā taiohi, mō ngā mō ngai tātou katoa. Nei rā taku mihi. Tēnā koe. O tēnei te mihi anō, e rere nei ki a koe e te kōka. Kei te whakāru aki au mō tō tsukāne a piri, Kwa noho pōhara tātou katoa te iwi, i e nei marama, noho moke moke, kwa taki mō te atea nei te kākau mōna ki tō whānau. Tātou katoa, te nei te aroha, e re re nei. Wai hoki ki tō Ki tō hikoe taka ki tō wānaka roa i rotu i te ao o te kapahaka, te ao o te moko kauai, o te karaka, tēnei au e mihi atu ki a koe, e pupuri tonu nei i tērā aho mā reikura. Nō reira, tēnei mātou e mihi nei, nō mai ki te wānaka, ki te webinaka, ki tēnei Kōrero e pāna ki te tohi, mō kā taitama tāne, mō kā taitama wahine. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā porua. Just before, Kitty and I were just sharing about some of our experiences in the recent weeks with our whānau and particularly our young men, our boys and the struggles that they're going through. So we're very much feeling that at this time uh, of takurua, of the of hine, the ihu or hine takurua. Mm. And wondering how, how your whānau is, particularly in that space of navigating that passage from child to adult. And if there are practices that your whānau or that you yourself have revitalized from te ao Māori or have held on to. Paina kia kōrero, kia timata tātou ki kōra. Ok, kia ora. Ok, heke mai te ua. Aui. Hai. Kia pūre nei e ahau. Tēnā koutou. He tino kōrero o tēnei kaupapa, nā te mea kua ngaro te nuinga o mātou tikanga, ngā tohi, ngā pūre. Engari, kei te hoki mai, kei te hoki hoki tonu mai i rā āhuatanga. So I'm born in the 1950s. None of our whenua were buried anywhere. I had babies in the 1970s. None of their whenua were buried anywhere. And it wasn't until I had passed having babies and was um, being a mum that I started to learn about these kind of practices that help ingrain us in our culture and to the whenua. So, you know, colonisation has, has wiped a lot of our tikanga from the surface of this earth. But he oi anō, you know, 
it's up to us to bring them back. So once I learned that, um, you know, burying the whenua was, was done to help hold your identity to your land, to help connect the child to the land, to, to give back to Papa Tuanuku and to, to nourish Papa Tuanuku, I made it a point that all my grandchildren, whenua, will be buried. So that, that's the first uh, reclamation of these kinds of uh, rites of passage that, that, that myself and my husband have been instrumental in reclaiming. So we live here in Porangaho on a two acre block and there's mokopuna, whenua all around us here. So this is the home base, you know, Porangaho is the hapu but Kurawaka is the home base. And they've all got little trees on them and they all know, oh, that's my tree, oh, that's my tree. And, and that's a very, very empowering uh, practice to reclaim. So, you know, I, I, I looked at um, where does it begin? Where do, where do rites of passage begin? Well, they begin, I believe they begin in the afterlife or the pre-existence life. So we choose to come to earth for a co-papa. There must be some kind of ceremony that sets that spirit of that child apart in order for it to enter the womb of its mother. There's the first one. And so Nanga Atua Tera. So that, that's a really beautiful, holy thought to think about. And then the first rite of passage other than being, um, or oh, isn't a conception. So, you know, we know that our, our tipuna had, had, um, had set up rites of passage all the way along, from wanting to be hapu, there was ceremony, and to when you were hapu, and then as the baby gestated in the womb of the mother, there were, there were certain protocols that happened along that journey. And then as the birthing drew near, there were protocols along those, that journey as well. But the first uh, rite of passage that a baby should hear, and this is one that I practice and I teach to the wahine who come to Karangawananga, is when the baby is born, the first, the first sound uh, that that baby should hear is a karanga from its, either its mother or its grandmother, Notetahi Wahine, mm -hmm. because that, that vibration in that karanga activates the, all the codes that have been imbued in the, in the fetus, act, activates them into awakening and opens, opens the kete within the, in the ngako of the baby. So, koera te mea tuatahi, karanga ki ngā, ngā pepe i te wā i whānau mai rātou. Let's claim that one back. And then followed by karakia. And then there's a whole, whole sequence of tohi ceremony in, in that short moment in time of um, calling the baby into the world. Uh, then the tohi blessing the baby by the by the tutama wahine me te tutama tāne. So my husband's there with karakia, I'm there with karanga, and the whānau are there with waiata, mōtete, mōtete waiata in particular. Because it's all about the vibrations of our reo that um, provide uh, calmness, activating kete that have been encoded in the mind of the baby while it's in the womb and singing ori ori. So we've, we've reclaimed the practice of singing ori ori at birth. And the ori ori of tu tere moana, which we, which I learned, oh, but as soon as I learned it, I knew straight away that this ori ori needs to be taught and applied at birth either through karakia or through waiata ori ori. So, so we did that with our mokopuna. And so we've witnessed the, the results of singing ori ori 
in the birthing rooms, at the hospital, wherever, doesn't matter where. And it's all about helping the mother and the baby work as one. So that delivery is smooth and the rhythm of the flow of the baby coming down, the ara namu namu is done in unison with mother and child and the delivery is successful. Hiraudu nui. So in, in that first verse of the Ori Ori of Tutere Moana is all this advice that, that we don't know is written there. But over the years of my mahi, I've, I've unraveled what I believe is what the, the Ori Ori is telling us. And it's telling us about process. You know, what's going on in, in the womb in those nine months and how to, how to ensure that birthing is a natural, rhythmical process because my births were harrowing and I didn't want that for my daughters. Mm. So, you know, we've, we've, we've come through several generations where that was stripped away. And I, I've got this image of the movie White Liars that Freddie Michael Black was in. It was a movie that was made. And, 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 and it shows us that how colonization and Christianity have stripped those old tikanga away so that we comply with the rules of the time of the white man. So that's enough of that. So now we have Māori midwives and our Māori, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the hākui for the Ngā Māia, Māori midwifery uh, body. And so it's, it's a reteaching game. We need to re, reteach, re, remember, because we already know the stuff, and reawaken these old ways of doing things and re, reclaim them and restore them where they rightly belong. And so it's taken generations to lose it, and it's going to take a few generations to restore it and put it back. So there, that, that, when that first initial uh, rite of passage is stripped, then like all things in our world as Māori, we're forever trying to catch up, to catch up, to, to get on track. And, um, and that, that's the way it is for us right now. You know? So that's why Māori need a Māori voice in government. So... We're, we've just had the launching of the Māori Party, you know, a Māori voice for Māori. So Māori have to reclaim these ways and restore them and, and re, rebuild them. And then, and then bury the whenua back in the whenua and do the karakia and do the karanga and then honour the baby by teaching that child no te whenua. Yeah. Koe te whenua, ko te whenua, ko koe. And then that's about papa and belonging. You know, I always claim that if we reclaim that one tradition, that one rite of passage, we will probably solve most of the problems that we're fighting against today. Because most of the problems today are about lack of identity. Our men are in jail, our, our boys are going haywire, because they don't know who the hell they are. Yeah. So by, by installing, re reclaiming that one tikanga, I believe we will slowly bring the stats down and rebuild our tutamatane and our tutamawahine also. Just by re reclaiming that one tikanga. Um, Narita. Uh... Hey, Tawira Noiho. Um, mm. if, if our Fano and, and our Taio here are having babies and they want to reclaim this momo, this tikanga, um, and they can't get back to te hau kainga, <coughs> I tonu kia tukui te whenua ki te wahi noho? Well, if it's impossible, but nothing's impossible these days, you know, it's as difficult as you make it. You can hold it in a, in a, in a pot plant. We've got all these lovely stories that have been put in fridges and been put in pot plants. And then when the time's right, they take the pot plant back to wherever. And, 
you know, there's, there's a way to do in everything. But, you know, I, I grew up thinking Namu was um, only found in Aotearoa until, until I learned that it's found all over the world. And, and Papatuanuku, I used to think, was just Aotearoa. But Papatuanuku is the world. So Ponamu is Ponamu wherever it's found. You see, so if you bury, bury uh, the whenua into the land, the land is papa. It's what proceeds, what follows on from having buried that whenua is the teachings. Okay, you might not own that bit of dirt where you live, but the whenua is papa tuanuku, so no to whenua, you are the land, so but it is better to take it home because by going home, all the stories go with it. So rites of passage are about um, obligation and responsibility. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of our youth today think they've got a right to this and a right to that. Oh, it's my right for this, it's my right for that. But they, they're not taught that Yes, we have rights, but with having a right, you have an obligation. Mm. And that applies in the Māori context of rights as well. So, so there, there's a whole, whole new teaching kete that needs to happen. Mm. You know, and it should be happening because we've got kōhanga reo, we've got kura kaupapa, we've got whare kura and we've got whare wānanga. So that's, if that's all about whānau, then, then, then these teachings should be placed carefully in all of those streams because the whānau unit is, is uh, um, usually a mixed race of cultures. But, you know, we, we've already set up the mechanisms to claim a lot of this stuff. We're just not using them because we're bound by government uh, regulations and whatnot. So we, we have to be strategic and find ways where we can reteach this stuff. And I guess that's why um, what we do here at Kurawaka has been so successful. Now for 20 years I've been running these programs and, and it's very liberating. It's empowering. Mm -hmm. And I use karanga as the tool that activates that liberation. So it's not about just about coming here to learn how to karanga, no. It's coming here to learn who you are, where you're from, what this voice is that resides in us, wahine, mm. what's the difference between a wahine voice and a man's voice, mm. and what can karanga do that a, a male can't do. It's all of that, and that, that's super empowering, empowering matauranga. So it's, it's a big job. Um, I know a big part of your mahi is is the, the remembering and the revitalization of Atsuhine in your mahi. Mm, yeah. And is that has that been a is that often a powerful uh, rite of passage for Wahine to come into that space and to remember uh, the power of Mana Wahine in relationship to our Atsua? Absolutely, Chaki. You know, we I use the book Wahine Toa by Patricia Grace and Robin Kahukewa, and I use the images, and we tell the stories, and 95% of the women would have never heard the stories. I didn't grow up knowing stories, but as soon as I started learning them, and then we, we analyze the story, the pūrāko. We talk about what's a pūrāko. And then we, we pull the pūrāko to bits and look for what it's teaching us. What are the lessons? What's the value of those stories? What's the moral of the story? And what's that pūrāko got to do with karanga? So those are the four things we extract out of the poor story. Papatua nuku's pūrāko hine ahuone, hine titama, Muriranga uh, Fenua, Hine Nui Te Po, Karanga, and Mahuika. Mm. Okay, we, we, we analyze those eight pūrāko over, over the time. And, and 
and Taki Timu teachings is we, we all come from Heneahuone. So we, we, we have come from a matriarchal origin. Now we've all grown up believing we've come from the rib of Adam. No, take your colonized eyes off and put your Maori eyes on and get this. You've come from the Kurawaka of Papa Tuanuku and you've been made by all the Atua, all the Atua and Papa Tuanuku. That makes you a Atua, a goddess, you see. So I transformed them all into goddesses through the Pūrāko. But you got to, you got to go into the Pūrāko and... Witty, witty, pull it, pull, pull it to bits, and and apply that to you as a Maori wahine of 2020. That powerful shit. <laughs> it's it's power. It's empowering. So I make them say, oh, "I am a goddess," and you know, some it takes a bit of a bit of a. Oh, am I? <laughs> But, you know, if, if we believe, if Māori believe in our culture, then that's what our culture tells us. We yeah. are all ascended from Hine Ahuone. And Hine Ahuone was made by all the Atua, Iyo included. And she was made of godly elements and earthly elements at Kurawaka. So where, where's Kurawaka? That was my first question. Well, where, where's this place, Kurawaka? <laughs> so that's taken me on a journey right back through the Hawaiian Islands. I believe I've found Kurawaka and it's on the island of Maui. Oh. And it's called Mauna Kawahine. And it's looked after by the Kapu Fano or Hana. And I've been there and I've, I've slept there. You know, so there, there's a there's a, a sequence of stories. Depends how much you want to dig into it. So all the women want to go to Maui and go to Kurawaka. So, so when when I um when I realised this was my destiny, okay. So we're all here for a destiny. I I knew my destiny in my teenage years. Hmm. And I, I actually believe I knew it when I was born. I think I was born awake because I was given away to um, an uncle and auntie who couldn't have babies. So I'm the baby of nine. There's five older sisters and three older brothers. But those three days, of first three days of my life, I cried and cried and cried. And so much so that my uncle took me back to mum and said, this baby needs to be with you, you see? Mm. So I thought, well, I knew then that mm. my destiny wasn't with that family, it was with my biological parents. Mm. Yeah. And then um, in my teenage years, I had, a, I had a dream or a visitation or whatever you want to call it, you know, telling me that I will work with women, that my, my future is to work with wahine. And, um, and I woke up from that night's sleep with that, that message was just so strong and I'd never forgotten it. And then I'm married at 18 and having babies and, and life goes on. And then, um, then I was put out on the marae at 17 to do the karanga at a tangi at 17. Mm. And the maho was full of queer, all in black. And I looked at my kroa and I thought, what? <laughs> get, get them. You know, but you, you, you did not question. You just got up and did it. Well, I couldn't speak Māori, but Brother Pity said, say this. So I said that. And uh, all was well. And, uh, and that was the, the igniter of my, my destiny as the kaikaranga. So 17, so I, I've had amazing, amazing experiences with sound, karanga sound, and kapahaka, you know, our, our life has been kapahaka, so you know how to push your voice out, you know how to, to ride the heavens and to open portals and things like that, so 
And then I've had some phenomenal experiences with other things other than human beings through karanga. Mm. So I, I've, I've experienced it, I've lived it. So I teach from conviction of having experienced it. Nothing was written. I looked and searched for things on karanga and nothing's written. It, 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 it went to the grave with the queer, you see. So our queer, the, the ahua of our hākui was changing. Our, our modern day queer grew up in the cities and didn't learn te reo and didn't speak or sing wa waiata. So that's how come our shāsha whānau became um, the kaitiaki of the, the pai, because we sang and we had pity to lead us. Pity was a catalyst in all of this. He, ta he taught us, so he was plucked out at a young age to sit by the kroa on the pie and learn the teachings of the pie pie. So Pity and myself had a, had a, had a different relationship with Te Reo mm. and with Te Ao Wairua. Different, you know, not better, not worse, just different. So, so he and I were, were obviously destined for what we would we do now so and and it's been beautiful and then you know i always knew there was more to learn and i kept waiting for someone to come and teach me even though i've grown up on the marae couldn't speak maori could sing it mm. loved it it loved it just it just it woke my soul it was my soul food but um always had a passion to learn and all of that so the the vibration of te reo maori was activating that that subconscious atomic level of dna and in, in every cell of your body <laughs> you know and that's what we need to be doing because we're all born with it yeah and sika tunu um ia koe korero mo te karanga you were 17 when you were um, put on the mark to do your karanga. How long after um, that particular uh, karanga did it take you to get back up or, you know, the queer support your role on the maho? Uh, well, not long, because I, I had a confidence that others didn't have. Mm. Yeah, and a lot of our queer at home here um, well, they, we found out that they did speak Māori, but they were very... <laughs> but they weren't taught, and they had moved away and lived. Mm. So then Kapahaka Tamatea Riki Nui came along, and then I was the leader of the Kaitataki Wahine of that, so that threw you back into the, the, the stage performance arena, and, and it just grew from there. So... And even though we moved to, to town to live, we always came home to Hui, always. I knew at a young age that that connection needed to be maintained. Mm. So when you say, you know, what if young people can't get back there? Well, you can do whatever you decide you want to do. You just might have to sacrifice something else in order to do it. But deep in my soul, I knew that always going home was a key ingredient to um, being a healthy Māori. Mm. It's not in the cities. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, can so you we... speak a little bit about, um, about the journey from pre-birth through uh, conception and into the, um, into the well, to the time of labour and then te whenua ki te whenua. If those processes haven't been followed and we have our taiohi or our tamariki reaching 12, 13, coming into their taitama phase of their life, what are some practices that we can do to support them in that transition that they're making from tamariki to um, pakiki? I think the, the first practice we could do and it's something I wish had happened to me, was for mothers and daughters to commune mm. intimately, you know, and sons. I've only got one son, so, but, but more about daughters when they have their first ikura. 
and and to talk about um, the, the development of the body through puberty as though it's normal. You know, and I've been lecturing at Tawananga or Raukawa since 1997. Um, and, and this beautiful man called No Ebiha, who's from uh, Matodi Bay, he used to tell us about how when he was a young boy, he had to wash his mother's soiled ikura garments because that was about teaching the, the, the tama and the wahine about, about life. So that's gone out the window. You know, it's all taboo now. Don't talk about it. Push it away. So it's about bringing, bringing the mātauranga back. And, and we have to wānanga. Matariki is a time for wānanga. Other than rugby, rugby, rugby. You know, you've got to blend the balance. And, but, yeah. So, you know, um, I'm in the process of writing a book on rituals. So I've found a book that's full of rituals. But we, we need to be doing things like that. So part of the wānanga in the, the third level is about us talking about creating rituals from birth right through to ruahinetanga, you know, when we go through menopause. Mm. That, that, that's, a, that's a ritual and a half. And how do you help one go through those phases? Mm. And I must say, I haven't, I haven't dug into the phases of the male as much as I have the female. <laughs> so, you know, it's about identifying the, the points of transition in one's lives, in our lives as human beings, and creating ceremony, ritual, to help shift our young out of one into the next. Mm. You've got, um, and, and we can do that through school. You know, when they leave kohanga and go to school, kura, they leave kura kaupapa and go to whare kura, they leave whare kura and go to wānanga. Those are all places where we can apply transitions because mm. a, a rite of passage is, is a transition point. It's a pai pai, it's a pai tapu. And, and the, the voice that activates the, the opening of the pai tapu is karanga. Mm. Okay. So the role of the wahine in all of those transitions is, is critical. So we need to be learning about that and, and then figuring out how we can do that and, and then doing it. Got to do it. That's the key. Yeah. Got to create it. But you know the odd the odds are stacked against us today, majorly in the in the in the systems that that we are are governed by. That's why you know everything's in such turmoil today more than in any time you know but if it is to be, it's up to me. that's a fucker I teach. I win or lose by what I choose. Okay, okuringa, te ao, you know, all, all of those kind of phrases. So what, if you, if you want change, you have to be the first to make change. You have to change yourself. So the mechanisms are there. It's just um, realizing that they're there and um, being, being able to step back and, 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 Facilitators of these kind of workshops need to do that, okay? And and write a book. Write a book on rites of passage for Tāne. Mm. And then get that book out there and then teach people to teach people because it's nothing new. Other cultures do it. We were having a kōrero the other day and mm. uh, the, the beautiful fire, Lenardine, said, I love it. It's not innovative at all. It's just Māori. I'm <laughs> sharing about Pautama, rites of passage. I was yeah. like, oh, it's a little, a little bit innovative, but <laughs> no, she's totally right, though. It's, mm. um, it's ancient. All cultures have this. Yeah. And I think about that African whakatauki. If you don't 
Uh, if you don't initiate your the young, they will burn down the village to feel the heat. Mm, yeah. And that's the importance. And I think about where we've come to uh, today in, in the space of colonization, the, the breakdown of our, you even look on the marae with the breakdown of our, our poor for the processes, which is the bastion, but there are so few kai kōrero and kai karaka out there um, yeah. that can hold down the marae. But it's like our teenagers are arriving to this waharoa um, or the tamariki that are coming of age, arriving to this waharoa. And they arrive and they're looking around, uh, you know, they're ready to enter a process. Mm. Looking, yeah. where's, aunt, where's Uncle Pat and where's Auntie Cherie? And, and there's no one there. No one there. And they kind of just wander in, you know, and they check it out and they're trying to, they're creating their own rights and they're doing it with each other. Um, so um, the word potama, there, there, there's your framework. Hey, I guess that's why you're called potama. You use the potama. Those are your rites of passage. Every, every step on that potama should have a rite of passage before, it gets, before you attempt the next step. That's what potama is about. So, so, you know, I, I, so we should celebrate where Māori Dim is at the moment. It's exciting mm. because we have the system set. We've, we've got my, my son, Doc, he's 40. He's, um, he's a product of a bit of kōhanga, uh, Pākehā schooling, bit of Māori in his teenage years, and then boom, hit te wā nanga o raukawa, and now he's fluent He's matato. He's he's got a great grounding in matau danga Māori. Married a woman who's been through all of those uh, education systems, and now their children are fluent in te reo. You know, so it's happening. It's mm. happening. Māori need to engage with Māori, and it'll take it'll probably take another two generations. So that that's me, my son, and his sons. His children, there's three generations. It'll probably take a couple more to start bringing it back to balance. Mm. But it's on the way. We've, we're on the way. And, um, and in order to help our rangatahi, our girls and boys, you know, become good parents, they need to be educated and afid because their par a lot of their parents missed the boat. And maybe their parents missed the boat, you know. Um, so it's an it's a intergenerational thing. But it, it can happen. Poka, were there rights around parents, you know, for becoming a parent? Were there? Well, there were. were. Yeah. Back in the day, there, there would have been. Not anymore. We live in, in quite a, a different world, a yeah, promiscuity world, uh, everything's at your beck and call world. And, and plus we have a system where um, young parents today can, can get benefits, you know, can get on the DPB. And, and even though that's great, um, by provide by the government providing a way out takes away rights and responsibilities from those parents. I know this because I've lived with it with, with my whanau. So you know you get hapu, you don't have to get married, but you can get uh, supported financially. So the man carries on doing what he's doing anyway because he's got no responsibility. Mm. We live in that world right now. So there's another angle we need to fix. We need more jobs. We need homes. We need better education systems. Yeah. Mm. It, it's, a, it's a whole network of um, a lot of dysfunction. <laughs> Sorry. Take a place to that. Take a place to that it all. And I think for, um, you know, not, not just taiohi or rangatahi with our young adults that are living within our communities, 
Meariari. Because when, um, you know, there may come a time where there is no system that we can rely on and we haven't had um, experiences um, to help navigate ourselves out of these situations. Mm. Yeah, tikanga kōrero. Aye. Yeah. You know, we have the Māori Women's Welfare League. The league was set up to help families, to help young families, to help mums and dads learn how to be good parents. Now, how many, how many rangatahi engage in the leagues? We've got Māori Women's Development there. I only that just running programs. Hmm? Maybe two years ago, I was introduced to the league, and um, when I went to the first hui, ira ira ngā kuia, korero hia ngā taki o te wā, um, te te tua papa o te kau papa, and for a very long time, in my own mind and eyes, um, that wasn't for young mummies or young families. Um, you know, and being informed of that kōrero at that hui opened my eyes and it's like, man, we're missing out on some really cool kōrero right here. Yeah. It's where yeah. the are sitting. Can I ask a question from the floor? Uh, it's related to mamas. Tēnā koe te kōka. How can I help my mama, whose twin babies were born, stillborn, mm. but she never held her babies, they were taken away? Could Karanga assist her healing? Ka nui te aroha ki a koe e hine. Oh, I couldn't imagine what that must feel like. <clears throat> karanga is, is the key to wellness. That's why Karanga opens the Pohiri ritual, unlocks the Puna Roimata, opens the portal for wai Wairua to come and be with us, Karanga. So, not, not knowing particulars, but the use of Karanga to help your mother release her mamai, yes. Go, go. I don't know if the, 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 the fetuses have been buried or what, but, you know, to... To help, to help release pain, karanga is a beautiful tool. Okay, and and you don't have to be the one doing the karanga. You could have somebody alongside the woman needing healing, and she could karanga. And when you karanga for a co papa, the co papa will determine what words come out of your mouth, okay? So you find the right kupu that say what the intention is that you're wanting for that moment and you send that to the heavens. And if the vibrations and the frequencies are on the right, um, right plane, that will activate that it will open and activate the puna mata of the woman and katangi. So the healing is in tangi. There's a, there's a whakatauki Timoti wrote, karitu. Ko tahi no iho te huarahi e e ai a aitua. Ko te roimata i heke, ko te hupe i fiua ki runga i te marae. Ka e a aitua. There's only one way to satisfy grief, and it's by the tears that fall and the snot, the hupe that comes out of your nose when you tangi hotu hotu and everything is released, then grief is satisfied. And that's why we karanga every ope that comes to a tangi. Not just the first one or the last one. No, everyone. So everyone's arriving with pain and grief. And, and that's, that's the role. That's the process. It's all about a process to, to help bring our people out of the poor. Ki te ao marama. Through, through all of the stages of the pōhiri that we go through. And the karanga is the catalyst that kick-start that process. 
and it should also be the catalyst that closes it when the ope leave. So te reo tuatahi, te reo o te wahine, me te reo whakamutunga should be te reo o te wahine hoki. But we all get up from the, the dining room and we all bugger off whenever we feel like and, and so we've lost the ritual of farewelling after the hākari. You see, so, so it's all fragmented and that's because we're not understanding why we're doing what we're doing. We're just doing it how we think it works. So it's all designed, it's all there. So that poor heady process is, is a beautiful process. We go through the process to help, you know, us understand ia wahanga o te pōhiri, he he kaupapa, he kaupapa nui, he kaupapa wairua, he kaupapa oranga, kei ia wahanga o te pōhiri, mai te timatanga ki te mutunga. And, and it's massive, it's fantastic, it's a massive framework. <laughs> that and the potama pattern and the paw and the rangi, they're all massive frameworks to build um, whatever you want on them. But you've got to know them first, don't you? Mm. And you've got to dig into them and unravel them and wānanga. So we're in Matariki. Matariki is the time for Wānanga. No reira, me Wānanga here, Tata. Mm. Yeah, we think, you know, returning back to that image of our Taiohi or our Tamariki arriving at the Waharoa and then waiting for that call that doesn't come <laughs> and then wandering in and having yeah. a look around and what, you know, stomping over the marae art there and doing their own rites and potentially even sort of jamming open the whare tūpuna and having a look inside and <clears throat> or the opposite which is a, a beautiful coherent kōwhiri yeah. where the whole whānau are there, where the, our, our marae kura, our ruahine, our ruanuku are there to guide, our tuākana are there to guide and support our tamariki as they go through that waharoa and come into yeah. adolescence, yeah. that time of education and then being called into Te Whare Tūpuna. It's, yeah. it's a beautiful vision there. It is. It's, it's, it's a strategically set of events that are designed to get you from Te Pō through the kore ki te ao marama. That's what the Pōhiri is about. Ko te whiri whiri ngai Te Pō. So when they're outside the gate, they're in Te Pō. They line up at the gate and they make their way through te kore. Ngā wahanga o te kore. Kore moi o ko wai rātou, no he rātou, he a rātou take. You know, so that, that gets unravelled as, as the karanga sends out words and oh, karanga mā kia mātou o tau, nui waka o tau, you know, take te mi waka. So all of that information that's being fed out is unravelling the kore mohi o. And by the time you've worked through all the wahanga and you've shared your ha with your visitors, ko marama. And you go and have kai and complete the whakanoa stage and celebrate the whānau kotahi. You know, we've arrived at oneness. So, you know, if, if, if the rangatahi are arriving at marae and they... They're not organised. It's, it's an organised process. It must be organised. It's you're ridiculous if you rock up unorganised. So the the powers that be need to be organised. <laughs> it's a marae. It's not a somebody's house. You know, it's not just a a place. It's a marae. It's our final cultural bastion point of Maoridom. So when the government took away, interfered in that with COVID-19 and gave the bloody police permission to enter and do what, you know, that was, that was the last straw. That, that was the last straw. How dare you take away our autonomy, our mana as tangata whenua on determining who enters our marae? How dare you? So, ko tai te wā whānau, ko tai te wā, maranga mai. You know, find your voice, 
reclaim it, restore it, rejuvenate in it, rebuild capacity. About the um, the entering of the farekai and the obligations as well that go with that, and washing your, you know, going in there and helping to wash a few dishes, and for our for our rakatahi, for our taiohi to be experiencing these, these obligations and these responsibilities and the importance of that. Mm. Yes, it, it's part and parcel. You know, when the wahine come here, we welcome them, but they do all the work. We cook we cook the meals, or if I need a hand, they, they help cook, but they learn. Uh, it's like a marae here, so they, they operate as though they're on a marae. So you, you've got to teach them. You know, and if, if, if they're coming through kōhanga, kura kōpapa, whare kura, they should be taught all this stuff in there. <laughs> and even if they're not, you know, if the parents today are, are as um, untaught or as ignorant or as whatever word you want to use, you know, don't know, um, well, then that's... Um, that just means they got to learn. So yeah. people, people have to step up. I think. Uh, can I ask one more question from the floor? What difference in today's society would be made if Kopapa Māori rights of passage reinstated within Fano Hapu anyway? If rights of passage were reinstated, rights of passage are designed to help um, a person transition from one phase to another. And that's about building strong people, strong individuals. So when you're, you're helped to transition through a phase, be it, um, or be it whatever, you know, the, the karakia and the ritual and the ceremony that goes along with that is all dedicated to the atua that we believe will help imbue the wisdoms, the characteristics, awaken those godly characteristics in the individual so that they can transform or transcend into the next phase and become stronger. That's what an ori ori is about. It's about building, building, um, providing information through waiata so that the, the, the child can trans, transcend each wahanga of its life to, to get to the point where it's a healthy individual, okay? So, and by, by, by bringing back ritual or tohi ceremonies or having, having pūre, pūre um, you're building the capacity of the individual. And by building the capacity of the individual, you will build the capacity of the whānau and thereby building the capacity of the hapū and building the capacity of the iwi. That's how it goes. Individual, family, hapu, iwi, nation. Hmm? So, um, so you got the tohi ceremony where, 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 where we use water. So water is, is our cleaning agent along with other, other agents. But, you know, to, and, and naming. Now naming Back in the day, the names of people changed when when good things happened, when when they accomplished something, they got a new name. Mm. So we've lost that one. You know, the first name you give your child should be a name with a bit of mana, not not Phoenix or Xelaba or you know, a name that that, that arrives and is is the the tapai nei runga i te tamaiti and um well, that's a debatable topic, that one. But, you know, another rite of passage back in the day was to rename the child. So I'm born Raina Shah Shah, or Sia Sia. We grew up Sia Sias until we found out that the right way to say that word is Shah Shah. So I became Raina Shah Shah. And then in my 40s, I found out that dad should have, Name me Teraina, but he missed out the tear. So I, I'd done a bit of a bit of homework on Teraina, because Teraina was Terangi Koyanake's daughter, only daughter, and she was a princess. So 
So when mum told me that I should have been named Tedina, only dad didn't, didn't write it, I reclaimed it. Mm. See? So oh, well, I'll have it, I'll have it, thank you very much. So I'm Tedina. But I've, I've got to remember that myself now when I'm talking about it. <laughs> so there, there's another rite of passage, you know. But and and they don't have to be deep and ho ho new and scary. Just so long as you create a little ceremony oh. and you you have a little prayer, you have water to to purify whatever's going on. And you have kai to nullify whatever tapu you're lifting, lifting, and you have fun. But in in, in it all is, is a strong message about the importance of those rituals and why you're doing what you're doing. Otherwise, we'll just rock on through life and be born and die and go. Well, what was that all about? And and never realize or actualize our destiny. Mm. See, so, um, and I, I believe that that's why um, uh, what I do is successful is because I know my destiny. Mm. This place, this place arrived through a series of events and situations that happened over, over my lifetime, obviously. Mm. But, you know, and, um, but I, I knew that and each, each event led to to a, a awakening in me that this is my destiny. And then one, once I locked into that and my husband locked into it with me and our children locked into it with me, boom, this place arrived. <laughs> 20 years later, you're still going. <laughs> thinking, I want to slow down. <laughs> but there's no slowing down. One door shuts and another one opens. So mm. It's lovely. It's beautiful. So, any other questions? I'm just looking at my notes. Tenei te mihi atu ki a koe e te marae kura kua kua tata pautewa. I think we we've got a couple more questions from the floor, but we might have to leave them for a post interview response potentially. <coughs> I feel like we could just keep going. Yeah. I want to get more into the porphyry process, and I think there's a question in there. Um, there's a request to talk about the whales. I think uh, I think we'll have to organise another another time with you, Fa. But yeah. I just want to say, hitene te mi atu kia koe mai te tahatani hoki kia koe e e kōkiri e e faka hahum nei i ka tika ka me ka matauira ka o te marae kura hei ora ka mo ka hine. Mokatane hoki, kia mau mahara tātou, te oraka nui mo te tahatāne, uh, kia tipu, kia, kia hoki mai uh, to tātou whakamana i te tahahine. Nō reira, i rotu i ahau, te tahatāne, te tahahine hoki. Ai, ai, kia ora. And I just want to say that uh, you, this, this mahi that you're doing is, uh, is decolonizing myself as a tāne, my ideas of masculinity and uh, and there's huge power in it as well and it's exciting for, for tāne. So tēnei te mihi ki a koe and this has been an incredible time that we've had with you um, and I just tuku the rāka over to te kiri, uh, hei whaka tepe in ka kōrero o te rāne. Uh, yeah, tēnā tēnā koe rata. Um, o tēnā ki a koe kōka he wai mari e tō māua noho ki tō taha i tēnei rā. Um, so many gems have come out and some of the kōrero that has been shared um, within conversation today has hit a lot of nails. As uh, Tiaki had said, we had had wānanga before this about um, our own whānau going through experiences at this time and Hotama writes a passage is absolutely an avenue that could help um, Fano like um, ours at the moment. And sharing your stories has been beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Karanga, uh, Pohiri, um, we love the process of Pohiri. We could sit there and talk about that all day. 
um, and also sharing good intentions with others and making a community um, to create rituals. If we don't know, it's okay. Make sure we're in safe places and you've definitely given some beautiful tips on Mupi here te anga whakamua i nai nei. Nā reira e mihi ana ki a koe. O tira koutou koutou pā harakeke. Koutou o kura waka. Kua whakairo hia te huarahi mō ngai Māori o tira mō te katoa i tēnei wā nā reira e mihi ana ki a koe. E nā koutou. It's been it's been a honor a honor to be a part of of this discussion, and and I know that these discussions need to happen, yeah. and um, and I'm I'm here if you need to talk any more I'm more than happy to I work from home, um, it's great what you're doing there's so much to be done, so e every little kete needs to be filled and katu te tu tamatane katu te tu tamawahine. I roto i a tātou katoa. Now, we have a, a feminine side and a masculine side in all of us. And that, that's hard for some of our men folk to, to come to terms with, but it's a fact. Yeah. So, yeah. Nō reira. Nei rā te mihi ki a kōrua, ki a koutou, a kai whakarite. Ki a koutou e mā takitaki ana mai. Ki nā koutou. Ki a kaha, ki a mana wanui. Ki a maia. Kia ora.